So today we have the question, max contiguous subarray sum. So in this question, what we're given is, we're given an array with positive and negative values. So I've numbered the indices here for you to see. We go from indice zero to indice eight, and our question is, what contiguous subarray of the array is going to have the largest sum? So, whenever we get a question that asks us for the maximum of a array or a group of items, sometimes I think heap if I'm thinking of quantities or largeness of value, but sometimes I think of dynamic programming. I think of using dynamic programming to find an optimal global solution based on smaller subproblems. I just want you to keep both of these in mind as we parse what this question means when we get first get this question as if we've never heard it. We get this array. First of all, I want to address what is a subarray? What is contiguous? What does that mean? So what does contiguous mean? So contiguous means we do not have a break in a snippet that we take from the array. So it would kind of look like this. So that is a contiguous subarray. Negative two and one is a contiguous subarray. Negative two, one, and three is a contiguous subarray. Negative three, four, and one is a contiguous subarray. Do you see how this line that I drew does not break? That is what contiguous means. If I do this, if I try to take a um, subset of this overall array with negative two, one, four, and negative one, do you see how we break here? That makes it non-contiguous. So what it has to be is contiguous. We need contiguous subarrays and we want the contiguous subarray with the largest sum. So how do we go about this question? So I want you to notice what your mind did when I introduced the idea of subarrays. You saw me enumerating the subarrays and maybe your mind might have went along and enumerated the rest of the subarrays. Maybe you started thinking, what are all the possible subarrays I could do? And when we get a question like this, the max contiguous subarray sum, you might be thinking, let's take all of the subarrays and see what their sums are and find the one with the maximum sum. This is the straightforward solution. If I was in an interview, I would immediately say, this is what my mind is going straight towards. This is the brute force and this is what I immediately think. So this solution is gonna bring us to a cubic time and a quadratic time solution. So let's look at the cubic time solution first. And by the way, the code is in the description. I think the code will explain it better than this video could even explain this problem. This video is just a walkthrough I want you to go through, but I think you'll learn a lot more from seeing the code for at least the naive approaches. But the final linear time solution might need some explanation here. Code is there if you need it. Let's look at the approaches. Now let's look at the first approach. So what we could do is we could do an exploration of all of the contiguous subarrays. So what I do is I plan to myself at the first item. I have a left and I have a right and I explore. I plant at a left, I explore. Explore a window, explore a window, explore all the windows to the end. When I hit the end, I close the left and then I bring the right back and then I keep exploring, and then I hit the end, and then I close in the left, and then I bring the right back. So that is our approach to look at all of the windows. So what we're going to do is something like this. I will get the subarray of negative two, and I'm going to find the sum in here. The sum of this subarray is just going to be negative two. That's pretty straightforward. And then we're gonna look at this subarray, okay? We look at the subarray of negative two and one. The sum of that subarray is negative one. So this subarray sum beats the sum of just negative two. So the new best subarray sum would be, so the new best subarray sum would be that subarray of sum negative one. We take another subarray and notice our left bound is still the first item. We haven't changed our left bound because our right bound has not hit the end of the array. For this subarray, the sum is going to be negative four. Does that beat the best sum we've had? It does not beat or the best sum we've had. It does not beat negative one. This is how the cubic and the quadratic solutions will do things. They're going to look at all of the windows. So the difference between the cubic and the quadratic solution is the cubic solution, what it's going to do is, it's going to get the sum for this subarray. It's negative two. And then what our cubic solution will do is it says, I want the subarray for this window. How do I compute it? The cubic solution will go all the way back to the beginning and say negative two plus one, 
and then we'll have negative 1. And then we're going to want the next window. And what our cubic solution is going to do, it's going to go all the way back to the left bound, all the way back to the negative 2, and it's going to say negative 2 plus 1 plus negative 3. And we're going to get negative 4. So do you see the problem there? Do you see how we're going to take a sum here, and then we're going to go all the way back. We're going to take a sum here and here, and then we're going to go all the way back, and then we're going to take a sum here, here, and here. We're going to be repeating work. Whenever we're trying to optimize an algorithm, we think of the bottlenecks, the unnecessary work, and the duplicate work. So this is from Cracking the Coding Interview. It's B-U-D stands for BUD, Bottlenecks, Unnecessary Work, and Duplicate Work. We're duplicating work by finding a sum for every new subarray. But the problem is we already have information about a subarray's sum. Do you see how the subarray of just negative 2, if we know that is a sum of negative 2, why would we take the whole subarray sum for these two items? Why not just add on the right bound that we just added? Our improvement to turn this into a quadratic time algorithm is that we notice to get the sum advancing between windows, all we need to do is tack on the right bound because we already have the sum for everything preceding that. So what we do is we get the sum for this window and then the sum for this window is going to be the sum for this window plus the item we just added. So now the sum for this window is just negative one. And now we want the sum for this window, but we already have the sum for this window. We just added one item. We just add negative three to negative one. The sum for this window is negative four. And now we want the sum for this window. We just added four. We already know the sum to the window preceding it. We've already done that work. We don't want to duplicate work. So we add four to negative four from the previous sub window. So what we get is zero. And like this, we eliminate that inner for loop. Again, the code is in the description. If you want to see that, we eliminate that innermost for loop and we take our time to quadratic time. And that is how the naive solution works. Whoa. And that is how the naive solutions work. The both the cubic and the quadratic time, what they're going to do is they're going to search all the sub windows and the way we improve between them is how we find the sub between the sub windows. So, how do we turn this into a linear time algorithm? Because whenever I see an array problem, I always try to think of ways we can solve the problem in linear time. So, what we need to introduce ourselves to, what we need to reshift our thinking to, is we need to start thinking in terms of dynamic programming and subproblems. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the dynamic programming approach. And the thing about dynamic programming is it's a very tricky topic. Every single problem has a different way these subproblems break down and relate to each other. But as soon as you see the subproblem, as soon as you see how they relate to each other, it becomes very straightforward. So there is a code sample in the description that runs in linear time and constant space. Here we're going to use linear space so that we can see the subproblems and we can see how everything works. But this can be done in constant space and the most efficient solution is in the description. So what we need to understand is whenever we build a dynamic programming table, whenever we do dynamic programming, it is not about memorizing what the table is about. It's about knowing the subproblems. What are the subproblems? That is our question. So when I am at this indice, my question right here is what is the maximum contiguous subarray sum if I end at the index zero? If my subarray, if the right bound ends at index zero, what is the maximum contiguous subarray sum? Our subproblem here. If my subarray were to end at the index three, what is the best that I can do in terms of subarray sum? So the different subarrays that end at the index three look like this. So these are all of the contiguous subarrays that end at the index three. All of these have an ending at the index three, they're contiguous subarrays. And then here, the subproblem here asks us, if we have a subarray ending at eight, what is the best, what is the maximum subarray sum we can achieve with the subarrays ending at the index eight? So that is what this cell asks. 
So each of these cells ask us what is the maximum contiguous subarray sum we can achieve with subarrays ending at each of these indices. So the answer to the question for the whole array is going to be whichever of these indices perform the best. Whichever of these indices have a subarray that ends at it that has the largest value, the maximum contiguous subarray with the largest sum. So that is what we're going to do. And the key to understanding this is at each point in our iteration, what does each item contribute? What are the choices that we have at each element? So we have two choices. Choice number one, we can start a new subarray at a certain item. We could start a new subarray at that item, which means that the subarray at that item ends at itself. If I have the subarray just just the four. This subarray ends at index three. So the answer at this cell of the best highest sum subarray ending at index three, the answer could be four. It could be four. We might just take the four and that is our contiguous subarray. That is the best we can do at this index. That is choice number one. We cut all our previous progress short and we say the best I can do ending here is myself. That's choice number one. Choice number two is we can continue the maximum subarray coming before us with the item we are sitting at. Let's just pretend if we have a maximum subarray ending at the index two, if the best we could do ending at index two is negative 12, when we are at index three, does the four extend the previous bests we've done in terms of a maximum contiguous subarray, or does four cut off the progress that we've had and just take itself? So these are our two choices. Remember our two choices. Do we start with this item, four? Choice number one, we chop off everything before us, we just take the four. Our other choice, we can continue the max subarray coming before us. The best we could do in terms of maximum subarray sum and to get index two was negative 12. So the best we can do at three, if we add on the item at index three, is going to be this plus the item at three. So negative 12 plus four. So negative 12 plus four is negative eight. So which choice do we make? Do we choose negative four? Do we choose to start? with this item sitting right here, or do we choose to make this item an extension of the subarray bests we've done before us? So which would we choose? We choose to have four start its own subarray. So do you see how four is the winner here? Do you see that it is a better choice? It's a better choice for us to choose to have four start its own subarray than for us to extend the subarray that was the best we could do right before us because we're going to be able to do better with just the four. This is hard to grasp at first. It takes time, let it sink in. But this is the essence of this problem and these are the two weighing choices we have. Okay, so the way we can start this off is the best we can do ending at index zero, well, it's just going to be index zero. On leak code, we have to have at least one item in our subarrays. So if we have a subarray ending at index zero, we have to include that item. So the best we can do at index zero is going to be the item at index zero itself. Okay, and now we can start doing comparisons. I'm sitting at index one. The value of the item is one. Do I start a new contiguous subarray that ends at one and starts at one because it is the item itself, or do I extend what came before me? Which do we choose? Let's compare our options. So one, if we start, we could just take the value of the item, or we do the best we've done right before us, plus the item that we're about to use to extend, so we get negative two plus one. So which do I take? Do I take one or do I take negative one? I'm going to take one. The best subarray, the max subarray sum of subarrays ending at index one, the best we can do is one. And what did we do? We only took the one. We did not extend. That would have hurt us. It would hurt us to extend this because our contiguous subarray would have a sum of negative one. It's better if we just take that item. So now let's move on. Do we just take negative three? Do we start a new contiguous subarray at negative three that starts and ends at 
two, or do I extend the best I could have done one index behind me? The best I could have done is a amount of one, so I could do one plus the value of this item to get the contiguous subarray that would happen. It could either be the whole thing. We don't know what subarray was taken ending at one. We don't know, but we know the best was one. So we do one plus negative three. What is the best we can do ending at index two? It looks like the best we can do is negative two. So we do that. We just do negative two. And what does this mean? The best contiguous subarray ending at index two looks like this. It looks just like that. Do you see how we're extracting the best answer at every point? And if we do this all throughout the array, we're going to get a globally correct and optimal solution. This is what dynamic programming is all about. Understanding our previous subproblems in work so we can understand the best answer to our current subproblem. So we're sitting at index three. So we have a value of four. Do I just start here or do I perform an extension on the best? I could do one index behind me. So negative two plus four, which is better, four or two? Four wins. The best I can do ending at index three is starting at index three. I just take the four, the answer is four. So let's move on. So do we just take negative one? When I say just take negative one, I mean, do we just start a new subarray at negative one? Or do we extend the best we could have done before it? Four plus negative one is three. Do we take three or do we take negative one and decide to just start at negative one? We want to take three. We want to perform an extension. I have no idea what the best subarray was ending at three, but I know its sum was four. And I know that negative one is albeit going to bring down the sum, but it's still going to be better than starting at negative one. So do we just take the two or do we perform an extension? Three, the best we did before it, plus the item two. I'm going to take the five because five is bigger than two. And now I am at this item. Do I just take the one and start a subarray all on my own? Or do I perform an extension? Five plus one is six. Do I perform an extension and have my best at ending at this index be six? Or do I just start at this index and yield a one? So I'm going to want to extend whatever the best was here. I have no idea what it was, but I'm going to take six. So, do I just take negative five? Or do I do six plus negative five? The best plus this item extending it. So, the best of those is one. I choose to perform an extension. So, do I just start at index eight and just take the four? Or am I going to extend the best, one plus four? And as you can see here, what we're going to do is we're going to choose to perform an extension and we get five. So this is the essence to this problem. This is the essence to this algorithm. This is how dynamic programming works. We see the best answer between subproblems. We see the previous work we've done, previous best answers we've gotten, and it allows us to deduce the best answer to where we're sitting. And we see that the best answer, the best answer is right there. It's going to be six. And we can see that the subarray is going to look like this. So this is the subarray with the best sum. And notice how it ends at index six and the best we could do at index six is the value of six. So this is what this is about. Do not be worried if this does not make sense yet. Dynamic programming is very difficult. It takes a lot of time for these things to sink in, the idea of these subproblems relating to each other. And it's not something that comes intuitively. It won't come to you instantly. It's, it's not the most intuitive thing. And in terms of time complexities and space complexity, you can see we used linear space here and we ran in linear time, but the code in the description shows you the constant space solution and runs in linear time as well. So that is all for this video. If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. This channel is all about empowering software engineers to excel in the interview and do their best and make these seemingly complex and difficult topics very simple to grasp. So, um,